I'll be telling you about the murder of Michelle Martinko. Michelle Martinko's case has been a hot topic in the true crime world for decades. After she went to the mall to buy a new winter coat, the Iowa teenager was found deceased in her car, and it clearly wasn't an accident. Her case went cold for almost 50 years, but has been recently solved using genetic genealogy. Even still, there are so many questions about the perp's motive. Why would someone want to hurt this sweet girl? It was a cold December day in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. The year was 1979, an 18-year-old Michelle Martinko needed a new coat for the brutal winter season ahead. At around 7 p.m., Michelle set out on a solo shopping trip with $180 in her purse. Michelle actually worked at that mall, so she knew a lot of the other employees there. She shopped, chatted it up with friends, and just did her own thing. The Martinkos knew their daughter was going shopping, but didn't anticipate it would take too long. When 2 a.m. rolled around and Michelle still was wasn't home, her dad, Albert, called the police to report her missing. He told them Michelle had gone out shopping in their 1972 Buick Electra. In the hours following, Michelle's family and the police scoured the town for Michelle, and at 4 a.m., she'd been discovered. Police officers spotted a Buick that matched the Martinkos parked by the J.C. Penney store in the mall parking lot. As the cops got closer and eventually opened up the car, they found Michelle's lifeless body curled on the floorboard of the passenger seat. She had clearly been slain by someone as she was coated in puncture wounds and vital fluid. During the initial crime scene search, investigators couldn't find any fingerprints or weapons. There were marks from a rubber glove on the exterior of the car, but no red stains or anything, which meant Michelle was most likely killed inside of the car. And there was a bunch of DNA on the inside of the car, which officials scraped several samples of to get tested. Upon discovery, Michelle was fully clothed, and there was no signs of violation, so a sexual motive was pretty much ruled out from the get-go. The cash was still in her purse, too, so it didn't seem like money was the motive. In the autopsy, coroners counted about 29 puncture wounds on Michelle's face, neck, and chest. Examiners also noted defensive wounds on the victim's hands, which led officials to believe Michelle didn't go down without a fight. Their estimated time frame for when Michelle passed away was 8 to 10 p.m. As for the weapon, it seemed like something sharp, but it wasn't a traditional blade. The authorities couldn't quite determine what the weapon was exactly or how big it was, which definitely made the investigation more challenging. So here's what we know right now. Michelle was most likely snatched up by someone in the parking lot, forced into her car, and jabbed with a sharpish weapon. The killer wasn't after Michelle for money or pleasure, so it was most likely someone who knew her and was upset with her, especially given the number of injuries she had. Whoever this person was, they wore gloves and were very careful to not leave behind any evidence. And although there was no one to determine this at the time, a police spokesperson said most people assumed the perp was male. This was later confirmed by a DNA test run on two samples of fluid, one from the gear shift and one from Michelle's dress. Over the next few days, Michelle's story was blasted out to everyone in the area, and police interviewed several witnesses who'd seen Michelle that night. Detectives had a hard time tracking down a suspect through Michelle's relationships, and rumors were floating around about Michelle receiving harassing phone calls before the crime, but the police were never able to confirm this. For a while, some officials and case followers believed Michelle was killed by a man named Dennis Lee McKee. This was because he just harmed a woman in Cedar Rapids a month before this incident. Apparently, he broke into this woman's house, held a blade to her neck, and threatened to off her sleeping kids if she didn't comply. Given those stakes, the woman complied with Dennis, who removed most of her clothes, taped her hands behind her back, and gagged her. After that, Dennis forced himself on the woman, who later stated in court that his actions hurt her worse than childbirth. Dennis then asked the woman if she had any substances, and when she replied no, he kicked her in the head, snatched some money from her purse, and fled the scene. I understand why Dennis was seen as a suspect, and I of course think it's best to entertain all possible leads and theories, but these two cases sounded pretty different, aside from the location and victim gender. The first woman was attacked in her home, 
physically violated and robbed, but left alive. Michelle was attacked in a public parking lot. She didn't appear to be physically violated and wasn't robbed of money, but was sadly robbed of her life. Over time, they too concluded Dennis wasn't the criminal in Michelle's case, but he was thankfully sentenced to life in prison for the other case. So back to Michelle's case. In June of 1980, the police released a composite sketch of the potential suspect based on descriptions given by two supposed witnesses who were under hypnosis. They said the perp was a white male in his late teens or early 20s who stood around six feet tall and weighed 170-ish pounds. But even after the sketch was released, Michelle's case remained stagnant. The authorities were starting to get desperate. They consulted psychics and posted a $10,000 reward for information that would lead to an arrest. Nothing. The list of suspects was ruled down, and over the years, those people started to pass away, complicating the case even further. One of the other names tossed around during this time was Michelle's ex-boyfriend, Andy Seidel. They dated for two years before breaking up, and they apparently ran into each other at the mall that night. It was definitely a possibility, but no evidence linked him to the case. Michelle's dad passed away in 95, and her mom passed away in 98. They both left left this world thinking Andy had done this to their daughter, but that wasn't actually the case. As awful as it is that so much time passed without finding Michelle's killer, that would also mean crime-solving technology had evolved, which would possibly allow for more evidence to be linked to a perp down the line. In 2006, Doug Larison, the cold case investigator assigned to Michelle's case, received a tip about a potential suspect. Doug followed the tip, which ended up falling flat, but it gave him another chance to review Michelle's case files. That's when he had a light bulb moment. Since some of the DNA collected from the car belonged to an unknown male, there might be a way to track him down using modern technology. So the specific samples that were tied to a male came from Michelle's dress and the car's gear shift. Detectives believe the man who killed Michelle sliced his hand by accident in the struggle, and that's how his flu fluid was left behind. A partial DNA profile was created from the sample, and it was determined that 1 in 100 billion people would be a match. So that really narrowed things down. The DNA profile was uploaded to the Combined DNA Index System, or CODIS, but no matches came up from the felons in the system. It was also tested against the DNA of Michelle's ex-boyfriend and that creepy criminal I told you about earlier. Neither came back as a match. In 2017, detectives reached out to a DNA phenotyping company to help them narrow down their search. Using clues from the DNA samples, the company was able to determine things about the killer's ancestry and create additional mock-ups of what he looked like. And the new images looked way different from the initial composite sketch. The following year, the DNA phenotyping company entered the information they had from the male sample into a genealogy website called GE. ED match. From that, they were able to find one partial match, a woman named Brandy Jennings who lived in Vancouver, Washington. Professionals determined she was the perp's second cousin once removed. The crazy thing about all of this is that Brandy uploaded her DNA to GED Match because she was trying to find out more about her father's side of the family. She said she submitted her information and kind of forgot about it all. Over time, officials were able to narrow down their suspect search to three brothers in Iowa who were distantly related to Brandy. The brothers were placed under surveillance while detectives plotted to secretly collect their DNA for further testing. On October 20th, 2018, one of the brothers, Jerry Burns, was spotted drinking soda from a plastic straw. When he threw away the straw, the investigator who was basically stalking him snatched up the straw and sent it off to a lab for testing. An analyst at the crime lab said the DNA from the straw was an exact match for the DNA sample collected from the crime scene. He also looked just like the most recent facial mock-up of the perp that was created by the DNA company. And just like that, this decades-old cold case had been solved. Investigators tracked down Jerry at his home in Manchester, Iowa, about 45 minutes north of Cedar Rapids. He tried to play dumb during his interview, saying he didn't know Michelle at all and had no idea why his DNA was found at the crime scene. Uh, because you were there. 
Jerry was unable to provide an alibi, and the investigator said he showed almost no emotion during the interview, even when he was eventually told he was being arrested. In February of 2020, the trial began. The prosecution presented all of the facts they had, including the DNA match to two samples from the scene and Jerry's lack of an alibi. The defense tried to claim there was no way to prove Jerry killed Michelle, even though his DNA made it on her dress and the car gear shift. Jerry's attorney was all like, how do we know Jerry didn't just leave behind his DNA at the mall the last time he went with his family and it transferred to Michelle when she came by that night? They also argued that the evidence was mishandled because it was all placed in one bag. Jerry's attorney claimed something might have gone wrong along the way, but even still, how would that explain his DNA being found in two places? Yeah, that sounds like a bit of a stretch to me. And it did to the jury as well because they found his guilty as charged. Michelle interacted with a lot of people that night, and none of their DNA was found on her dress or in her car. So based on that information, and the fact that Jerry couldn't provide a solid alibi, the jury felt confident convicting him for the crime. There was also a video played in court where Jerry said he could have blacked out that night, but he wasn't sure. In August of 2020, Jerry was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, even though we know who the perp is, there's still a lot of speculation as to why Jerry did what he did. At the time of the crime, he was 25 years old and lived in Manchester, Iowa. I couldn't find anything in the reports that suggested whether or not Jerry and Michelle knew of each other. All I could find was this quote from Michelle's brother-in-law about Jerry's motive. He said it lies in a deeply selfish, lifelong personal need. A need Mr. Burns kept hidden all his adult life until now. So do you believe that Jerry is Michelle's killer? If so, what do you think his motive was? If not, who do you think was responsible? Thanks so much for watching Killer Bites. I'm Brandy. I'll see you next time.